Good afternoon. On behalf of everyone here at Carnegie Science, it's really a pleasure to welcome you back to our virtual lecture series. Today we're going to hear about symbiosis, which is a mutually beneficial interaction between organisms. And in some ways, uh, I think these virtual lectures are supporting uh, a type of symbiotic relationship with all of you in our audience and us here at Carnegie Science. We benefit by, uh, by the opportunity to share our research with you, hear your questions, and we always take encouragement for all of your support. And we hope that you are benefiting as well by learning more about Carnegie Science and also the work that we're doing here to expand humanity's understanding of the earth, of life, and of space. There's just one major difference in biology. Symbiotic relationships require usually very close physical proximity. So I suppose that what we're doing here is we're inventing a new, a new type of virtual symbiosis. So now I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Yixian Zheng, who's the director of our Department of Embryology. Uh, Dr. Zheng is a cell biologist. His work focuses on understanding the proteins that form the architecture of a cell and on looking at the ways in which those structures enable cells to organize their genetic material and to regulate how cells divide, how they recreate. Uh, she's here with us today to talk specifically about the symbiotic relationships between coral colonies and the algae that gives them their colors and even more importantly, supports their life. And uh, Carnegie scientists have been doing this kind of work, studying the effects of climate change, of, of devastating effects, I should say, of, coral ch of, of climate change on coral bleaching for several years now. Um, probably many of you have heard the way bleaching occurs is that a coral reef colony comes under environmental stress. It could be increasing temperature, salinity, water acidity. And under these stresses, uh, the coral expels its, its symbiotic relationship with the, al expels the algae in, from their tissue, causing coral to be completely white. And if these stresses continue for any long period of time, it essentially kills the coral, does permanent harm and kills the coral. The entire reef ecosystem then dies. And as global warming heats our oceans, these bleaching events are becoming ever more common. Uh, and of course, if they can't be stopped, Carnegie researchers have predicted that coral reefs could actually disappear by the end of this century, which is happening very quickly. Uh, now, our researchers in other departments, global ecology, plant biology, have looked at these bleaching events on a global scale to try to understand, understand the full scope of the problem. And their work in particular, in one example, led to this invaluable online atlas of coral reefs around the world, which makes it possible to identify the at-risk coral communities uh, in real time. But as we think about the global scale, we also need to really look at these complex bleaching events at the cellular level to really understand what uh, the triggers that disrupt the crucial symbiotic relationships between the algae and their coral hosts. So Dr. Zhang and her team have been applying the sophisticated techniques of modern molecular biology, many of the techniques learned, for example, in biomedical research to this really urgent ecological challenge. And their discoveries have huge implications for our understanding of these fragile ecosystems, and we hope for our ability to take action to save them. So Dr. Zhang uh, brings really impressive credentials to this work. She earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Sichuan University and a PhD in molecular genetics at The Ohio State University. After a postdoc uh, at the University of California, San Francisco, she joined Carnegie as a staff member in 1996. She also served as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator between 2000 and 2012, and she was named director of her embryology department in 2017. So I'm very eager to hear her presentation, and I know you are too. too. So please join me in welcoming Yishan Zheng. Yishan? Hi, everyone. It is great to meet all of you virtually now, and hopefully in person, at least with some of you, in not so distant future. As Eric had said, I have studied a wide range of basic biological problems in my career, but never corals. But about three years ago, I and my colleague, Dr. Chenming Fan, who is a developmental biologist, as well as a stem cell researcher studying mostly muscles and tendons, have joined hands to study corals, along with two young, very talented scientists shown here, Dr. Ming Jie Hu and Xiaobing Zhen. These two young scientists are equipped with really advanced molecular biology technology, as well as uh, bioinformatic skills. And today, what I will do is to talk about how our team 
have used our expertise to under to study coral, why we want to study coral, and what progress we have made in our effort. Corals shown here live in this beautiful uh, reef system. They are actually animals like us. Corals form reefs because they, some of them can secrete calcium carbonate to build this hard exoskeleton, and then that forms very large reef systems. Coral reefs have the second highest biodiversity following the rainforest. In fact, about 30% of known fish species live in coral reefs, and the reefs are nurseries for more than 25% of fish species. Many of these fish are, provide, are those fish that provide important protein source for mankind. Corals also uh, protect about 20% of the world coastline from storm surges. Recently, people have become increasingly uh, recognizing corals as a source for many natural products that are medicinally very important, including several that's been discovered as life-saving anti-cancer and antiviral drugs. As a whole, coral reefs are estimated to produce, to generate about billions of dollars of income. So, corals and the reef system it produce are very important for mankind. I want to also mention that study corals at Carnegie is not something new to our institution. In fact, Carnegie is one of the first in the country and perhaps in the world to study coral reefs in great depth in our then called Marine Biology Laboratory, established in the early 1900s in the dry Tortugas, Florida. Now this area is beca has become national parks. This picture shows the lab building and two of Carnegie marine biologists. This effort of studying coral reefs have continued for about 30 years until the institution decided to close down this effort and move into areas of biology that are more urgently needed in order to make progress in understanding how life works. So in a way, our current effort are simply a continuation of Carnegie's past explorations. One important practical reason, as Eric has alluded to, for us to study coral, is that these important organisms are dying around the world due in fairly large part to global warming. Um, here shows you a um, survey published in 2017 all the dots show you where the corals are around the world. The red dots shows you um, the red dots show you all the dead coral reefs, while the um, orange ones show you the reefs that are in the process of dying. And then the shades of dark blue to light blue shows you the density of corals um, uh, around the world. So as you can see, clearly the world's corals are at the risk of being wiped out if we don't do something about it. Because of the importance of the coral reefs, people around the world are making effort to save corals. There are multiple mitigation and cons conservation efforts such as uh, policy change that could help people to change their behaviors to slow down global warming. Um, so some people are also planting corals in place where coral reefs are dead. Uh, some civil engineers are even proposing ways to shield coral reefs from sun rays during a uh, warm month. We believe though, effective efforts, uh, approaches require fundamental understanding of coral biology and why corals are dying. This is where biologists like us can make an important contribution. There are indeed tremendous progress made in understanding modern medicine through understanding how biology works. Obviously, we cannot understand, we cannot do experiments in humans, just like it is difficult to do experiments in all the corals living on reefs. However, most biological processes are shared in different organisms, among different organisms. In the past four decades or so, Biologists have used simpler organisms such as these shown here, the yeast, the fish, and mouse, frogs, and, plant, uh, and mustard plants to really understand biology. 
And this effort really has been tremendously helpful for, under, for us to know human biology, for example. Uh, our studies of these organisms is the reason now we can understand human immune system and how we deal with diseases. This is the reason now scientists around the world are able to develop vaccines and treatment for COVID-19 disease, a pandemic that's facing the humanity right now. So we believe the model organism approach will also allow us to understand coral biology and also why corals are, lying, are dying. This could eventually help to devise effective strategies to save corals. Carnegie biologists have been leaders, in fact, in the developing and using model organisms to study biology. Here, um, I show three example model organisms that Carnegie biologists have made major, major contributions into their development and usage. Although Carnegie uh, only has about 16 bio biology faculty at any given time, three Nobel Prizes have been awarded to its biologists. Alfred Hershey, Barbara McClintock were awarded for their discoveries of um, DNA as genetic material and also jumping genes respectively. More recently, a Nobel Prize was awarded to Andy Fire for his discovery, co-discovery of an important phenomena called RNA interference, also sometimes referred to as RNAi. Incidentally, I want to mention Andy Fire was a scientist in my host department um, called the embryology department. Um, he made this di discovery actually right next to me. His lab is next to me. So it was really great to see how a discovery, a major discovery was made right next to my lab. This discovery is now allowing biologists to study gene functions with unprecedented uh, convenience. It is also allowing us to study coral biology. Studying coral biology is also an important frontier for basic research. The amazing biodiversity on Earth came about through positive and negative interactions among different organisms. Although we have gained tremendous progress and understanding in how each organism functions by itself, we have very limited understanding of how organisms interact and evolve to create ecosystems such as these two shown on this slide. We believe that we have mastered the, uh, mastered the knowledge and techniques to explore this new frontier of understanding organism-organism interactions. It turns out coral survival requires intimate organism-organism interactions, and I will explain in the next few slides. So as Eric has alluded to, uh, organisms really need, have this uh, living together um, uh, habit of a bit mutually beneficial. So one example is the gut microbiome, that the microbiomes live in our gut and their, their interaction with our gut is critical for human health. And with the, when this uh, microbiome biomes go bad, um, they, uh, we, we develop diseases. This kind of relationship really refers to, uh, in this case, refers to the organisms living outside of the individual gut cells. And the next term I would like to explain is a more intimate uh, symbiosis relationship called endosymbiosis. In this case, uh, one organism, such as the ba bacteria, could take up uh, to one or two other bacteria and form this endosymbiotic relationship. In fact, studies have shown that this kind of organism living in another organism uh, has evolved into animals and plants we see today. So this is really a very fundamental process in biology. However, we really don't understand this uh, endosymbiosis, uh, endosymbiosis pro process. Um, so studying corals will obviously really help to understand the fundamental biology, which we don't understand yet. Corals are colonial animals with many individual polyps shown here living together. This, this yellow uh, dotted circle and this tiny uh, white circle indicate those individual polyps, and many of these live together. Some corals can calcify. That's why they can actually produce these, uh, these exoskeleton 
uh, that corals can live on them. All corals, though, perform endosymbiosis. Here, in this enlarged white circle, you can see the algae that live inside the coral polyps. Only, although the, all corals perform endosymbiosis, only certain coral cell type can do this task. Um, as many of you know, um, coral uh, algae and plants live by because they can perf perform photosynthesis. Um, so the the algae li living inside the coral can perform photosynthesis. So corals is kind of like animal and plant combined together. Um, this photosynthetically pr provide a, a produce nutrients, allows the coral and its algae to share their nutrients to mutually benefit from this endosymbiotic relationship. Corals are dying because they are losing their algae in the process called bleaching. When corals also oh, because algae produces coral, uh, coral the color. So with, when the algae uh, are lost, corals become white, as shown here. Currently, uh, scientists believe this is uh, believe this is how uh, uh, coral perform the endosymbiosis and then undergo bleaching. Here in the panel in the middle shows you this cross cross section of coral polyp. Uh, they live on this uh, exoskeleton shown here in dark. In the cavity of coral uh, lives some cells that are enlarged to, to your right. Uh, some of these cells can recognize algae shown in these dark circles. And once the right algae is seen by these coral cells, they will be taken up and put them being put in the membrane sac. In the membrane sac, called the symbiosome. And um, this, the, the algae inside this symbiosome can perform photosynthesis. And then there are um, transporters on this membrane surface that allows the algae and corals to share their nutrients. So bleaching really represent, people think, during bleaching, what happens is either the coral is not, cells are not happy or the algae is not happy of the condition. So the algae just leaves the coral be, or being expelled. Or the coral cells containing algae are dead. Um, or the coral cells containing algae basically detach and being lost. However, because we really don't understand any of these processes, we don't even know which of these cell types perform endosymbiosis. So it's really not possible to understand why corals are, uh, are undergoing bleaching. So, as I said, to understand this basic biology of endosymbiosis, uh, we need to have some model organisms, but the existing model organisms is not usable because they don't perform endosymbiosis. So we had to create a new model um, of corals to do this. After growing multiple corals in our laboratory aquarium, we decided to use a coral called the zinnia, as shown here. Um, this zinnia um, is very easy to grow and maintain. Um, they grow very fast and they are very robust in regenerating if they are damaged. Interestingly, these corals can also perform calcification. Therefore, it will also allow us to study how coral can secrete calcium carbonate. Uh, on your right, is a sped up movie showing uh, the time and you see the coral is not as pinkish. And you can see the polyps shrink into its face. We think they're sleeping. And then when light comes back up here, so they look very pretty and pinkish. And they never have that behavior. So as you, this coral really has a really wide variety of behavior and biology that would allow us, uh, that also would make it a very good model. So by studying this coral and applying advanced molecular technology and machine learning, we have been able to identify the cell type that can perform endosymbiosis. And by doing so, we're able to discover genes that are likely to be involved in recognizing, selecting the right uh, uh, 
right algae and taking them up, genes involved in taking, genes involved in taking up the algae, as well as genes that are uh, involved in transporting nutrients between the algae and corals. With this understanding then, we are able to further uh, explore how these particular cell types live you know, how they are produced, and then do they live forever once they become an endosymbiotic cell type? Do they live forever, or they actually are continuously replaced? So this is what's called the normal condition of endosymbiosis. So um, to do this, we really need to amplify um, this process of uh, coral endosymbiosis. Uh, we then developed a model that allows corals to regenerate as you know, when an organ, organism is regenerating self, itself, it needs to produce many of, the, many of the cell types that, of course, magnify in the process of, of each uh, cell type going through the process of maturation or even death. So, by, um, so this actually shows you the regeneration, how we do the regeneration. We just simply cut away the coral polyps, uh, the coral um, tentacles of the polyp. And then we can wait for the, temp, uh, to, for the stock to regenerate to form a full polyp. Or we can also plant the tentacle, individual tentacles um, on tissue culture dish, and they will regenerate the stock and all eight of their tentacles. And you, as you can see, the days, um, they can actually, it's not that long before they can regenerate. By utilizing this regeneration model, we then are able to really discover uh, how the cells progress, uh, how the endosymbiotic cells can progress through their life uh, span. So this is a, rep a graph representation of our finding. Basically, each dot represents a cell, and cells that have similar gene cells that have uh, similar gene expression are shaded, are colored in the same color. Um, so you can see that the corals actually the endosymbiotic cells start with as a stem or progenitor cells that don't have algae. As they are expressing genes that are involved in, that allows them to do endosymbiosis, these cells then will start to take up algae to become algae-containing cells. So these would be cells that actually can perform endosymbiosis. After several, after days, these cells actually will lose their algae to become algae-free cells. Um, by looking at the gene expression in these cells that are losing their algae to become algae-free, we actually discern a features of aging cells or stress cells. So what this finding tells us is that coral uh, endosymbiotic cells are not living forever. They're like some of our own cells, such as our skin cells. They are born, they become skin cells, and after a while, they just be replaced by new skin cells because the old ones die out. So with this knowledge, then we are able to develop for additional models to understand bleaching. So this is a coral bleaching model developed by Ming Jie. Here shows a full-grown coral polyp growing under normal conditions, and when this kind of full-grown polyp is placed in a bleaching condition, after a, few, after a few days, they become pale and they become smaller and smaller. The reason for this is because they are losing algae. They don't have enough nutrients. They had, in order to survive, they had to eat themselves, so they become smaller. So by applying the similar technology, uh, we then can see, look at the differences between the bleached coral and the uh, healthy coral grow under uh, normal conditions. So the yellow dots represent normal uh, the corals, uh, coral endosymbiotic cells from the normal coral, whereas the red ones represent cells from the bleach coral. As you can see, most of uh, their uh, cells progress through this normal, the normal progression from progenitor cells all the way to the algae-free cells. But for bleach corals, you can see accumulation of this odd a group of cells that's really not seen in the normal progression. And they have different gene expression. So this really opens the door for us to begin to understand the genes that's changing during bleaching. With this, we hope to be really able to uh, devise um, 
effective mitigation efforts and maybe even one day being able to engineer corals that are more resistant to bleaching. So thank you for your attention. I'm now open for questions. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation and it's cool to get to see work that is so brand new, hot off the presses like this. So we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with two similar questions we have uh, from attendees who want to know is about the white color of bleached coral. Is, is that the reason for the name bleaching? Is it just the white color or is bleaching have some significance uh, beyond that? And then also, is there any coral that is uh, white when it's healthy um, that could be confusing in some way in trying to study bleached coral? Um, yeah, so bleaching really is referring to the actual appearance of corals turning white. Corals all actually have colors because, first of all, the algae provides color and also under fluorescence uh, illumination, corals would also have some of their own color because they have fluorescent proteins. But mostly when the coral color is provided by the algae, yes. So coral bleaching really is referring to the algae that got lost. I actually personally don't know of any coral that is completely white. Thank you so much. And then a similar uh, question about bleaching is, um, how do we know that the bleaching is caused by, by worming? Um, what is the research that we can do to figure that out? I know some of your colleagues at one of our other departments are work on that particular issue, if you could elucidate that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, what, of course, any science started with by performing correlative, correlative studies. Ecologists have really observed a very tight correlation uh, between heating, heat waves, and bleaching following after that. And then when you have extended bleaching period, then the corals basically cannot recover, they'll die. So that's kind of uh, the field experiments, field observations showing the very, very tight correlation between heat and bleaching. Of course, coral disease can also cause bleaching if you have this uh, very bad increase in certain um, uh, nutrients uh, when the, 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 the coastal line becomes very contaminated, coral will get disease, they will also bleach. So those are correlation studies, but you can also um, model this in the lab. You can see that if you grow coral under high uh, heat, they'll, they'll go through bleaching and die. And then as a follow-up question, one of our attendees is wondering, would it be possible to cool the water surrounding the coral through some kind of engineering-based method of pumping colder water from the depths into the shallower areas where the reefs are? Yes. So uh, engineer, civil engineers mostly uh, really are looking at this um, issue. Yes, the pumping water is definitely one possibility, but they will be needing a lot of water because the ocean is too big. So I actually read about people are suggesting to use very thin uh, film to cover uh, the water um, that also allows air exchange, but provides shade. Uh, about the coral reefs. That's one uh, strategy some people have proposed. So we'll see. I, I think a civil engineer, I mean, you know, we know you can actually make a land out of ocean. So I, I, I believe civil engineer will, will make a contribution in med mitigation. It's, it's cool that this is a field where there can be biologists and ecologists and engineers and everybody working different angles to try to solve this major societal problem. Speaking of the biology side, we have a question asking um, how much of what you were able to accomplish with identifying these endosymbiotic cells was possible because of recent advances in molecular biology techniques? Would it have taken a lot longer to do this a decade ago or two decades ago? Yeah, I would say everything. Everything. I think one very unique thing biologists like us who actually never studied marine biology, but mostly studying basic uh, biological processes, is that we really are always at the forefront of technology development. And of course, one of the areas technologies develop very, very rapidly is biomedical research. Um, 
and and because also it's supported very well by NIH, for example. So uh, we have expertise in this area. That's why we're able to do this. I mean, you know, when we, when the biologists were building model organisms in the past, it usually takes years to get the model organisms ready to allow you to solve biological problems. But with machine learning, advanced technology, it, it really makes building model organisms to be a matter of a year. So you can actually get with starting to understand basic processes. It's amazing how much things can advance once that technology goes to the next level, then the knowledge can go levels and levels beyond that. Um, so I have a question. Um, you talked a little bit about this in your talk, but someone uh, would like a little bit more detail about what makes coral such a challenging animal to study. Is it something about the way that it grows or is it just this endosymbiotic process itself that makes it so difficult or is it a host of different factors? Um, so I think it depends on what kind of study you want to perform. Um, in, in our case, this zinnia actually is not hard to grow in the laboratory. Um, it does have its limitations. When we grow them in the laboratory, we still don't know if they actually undergo sexual reproduction. They can do reproduction asexually, such as through regeneration. And uh, we can really use them to study a lot of details. Um, so I think one reason corals can be hard to study are those hard corals that are involved in building major reefs. Um, those corals actually grow very, very slowly and they um, only reproduce sexually once uh, or twice through this, what's called spunny. Um, of course, it's harder to study those organisms, but I would say that our department just hired another uh, young faculty, really amazing young faculty, Phil Clivis. He is able to, he's actually the first person, perhaps right now, the only person who is able to do uh, CRISPR engineering to, to alter coral genes of, um, uh, of the eggs that he, he could collect through his collaborators at Great, Great Barrier Reef. That really opens the doors to really be able to start to engineer corals that are hard to work with. And then as a follow-up question, since you talked about engineering corals, uh, someone is asking, is it possible to engineer coral to make it more heat resistant? Um, and will your work help in accomplishing that? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question, uh, just like all the other questions. Um, people have been taking two different approaches to hope to um, engineer coral. One is to use algae. Um, there is this thinking that maybe uh, you could, some algae actually are more heat resistant. So if, you, if corals are living with this kind of algae, they can actually, per, they don't undergo bleaching. Another approach, of course, is to understand what are the Achilles heel of the coral side? What are the genes that make some corals very sensitive, other corals not sensitive to heat? So hopefully if you could either breed corals, cor breed um, resilient corals with non-resilient corals, maybe you can select traits. Alternatively, you could just change the genes through engineering in the less resilient corals to create more uh, resilient corals. Now, all of this really requires basic understanding of either the algae that lives with coral and their interactions with the coral or the coral themselves. If you don't understand any of the genes or the processes, you won't be able to do anything. Just like modern, bio, modern medicine really is helped by basic biological studies. Yeah, this is a perfect example of how basic science research can have so many important societal uh, effects uh, once you understand those basic processes. So we have a pretty sophisticated question here from one of our good friends from the observatories, actually. Um, <laughs> Simon asks, uh, are changes in the gene expression caused by methylation of the DNA or histones in the coral cells? Um, so I think there are some studies suggesting uh, there are changes in coral histone modification. So 
you know, DNA are wrapped around proteins called histones. And this wrapping around is very important to allow DNA to select which genes are being expressed. So coral bleaching affect the gene expression in part through this um, so-called epigenetic modification, such as modifying the histones or even modifying the DNA. I think there's also some reports about possibility of DNA methylation that's changing. Although um, those studies are all still at the whole population level. What's really important is to, again, get into the molecular detail, cellular detail, to understand which cells are changing and what the communications during bleaching that happened that causes some cells to change, some cells don't change, and, and how this change causes gene expression change. And then we have a couple of uh, basic coral questions. So uh, someone wants to, you to clarify, does the, if the algae leaves and the coral bleaches, does it die right away or is it sort of a slow starvation process? And then uh, similarly to that, we have another question where someone asks, uh, is it hard for the algae in coral to perform photosynthesis underwater compared to plants that are on land? Or is there a limitation of sunlight uh, or is that not an issue above a certain depth? Okay, so I kind of forgot about first question when I was focusing on second question. The first question, oh yeah, I, I remember. So the first question is about how long it takes the bleach coral to die. It does take a while. Um, they, like I showed the, in laboratory bleaching coral, it took them a while because they can first shrink they can basically eat themselves until there's nothing left to eat, they'll die. So this is why actually some coral reefs can recover from heat, uh, induced bleaching, as long as the heat is not too long and the, the bleach is not massive. So they do recover. Um, for re regard to the second question, which is, um, what's the second question? <laughs> is, it, is it more challenging for the photosynthetic algae? Oh, yeah, that that's are symbiotic? an interesting question. So basically, um, many people, I mean, algae can live in the ocean. They are, I mean, this type of algae is also called dinoflagellates. They live in the ocean. There are many kinds of dinoflagellates. They don't need corals, but why do they get into the, uh, the coral? Are there any benefits? In fact, uh, in, our, in our team, we have a new postdoctoral fellow coming, joining us. He has a background in plant biology. He's very interested in, in understanding perhaps there are advantages for these algae to live inside the coral. One advantage might be iron. In fact, our ocean is iron free, uh, iron poor. So, but, but animals are very much iron rich. So perhaps cor the algae actually could utilize this endosymbiotic relationship to uh, utilize the iron. And in fact, you know, when you have a lot of dead animals or, or uh, ocean um, contamination, you end up with a lot of uh, iron, then you have algae blow up. And that leads right into, perfectly into the next question, which is, are there people studying how coral and algae evolved into this symbiotic relationship? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, no, so I would say we don't really know. And in, um, one part of the effort that our team is engaging in is to try to understand how this could come about. And one way to do this, which actually is supported by more foundation right now, we, we've gotten support uh, starting this year for five years from more foundation. And part of the aim we have is try to really analyze the endosymbiosis across different species that perform this particular task and also the related ones that don't perform this endosymbiosis and by analyzing the genes that's different we hope to be able to find how you end up having this feature or lose this feature therefore understanding um, the evolutionary uh, principles governing this important one. And uh, we have a question. Someone is wondering if you can tell us um, where zinnia, the coral that you study, where that might be found in nature, in the world, what parts of the world that grows naturally, and do you know? Yes. Um, so this, 
Another name for this coral is called pink pong pong. Um, you can find it in Red Sea. Uh, I think, you know, you know where Red, Red Sea is. So it's very popular there. Um, it, it really likes warm temperature. So yeah, it's naturally happening there. But it, you, can, you can buy them actually in any aquatic shops. They're always being kept because they're easy to be, it's easy to grow them and they grow fast. It's a common coral for home aquariums and yes, things like that. It's very common for home aquarium. Very easy to grow. Our corals are actually quite hard to grow. And we have a question from Josie who asks, you talked in the beginning of your uh, presentation about um, other kinds of organism organism interactions besides just the coral algae relationship. Are, what can your studies teach us about other kinds of organism organism interactions or is it too early to say yet? Uh, well, so it will definitely help us to understand the organism organism interactions involving one cell taking up another cell. So, you know, for one cell to be able to take up by another cell and this other cell has to have genes that essentially generally is shared that they do this process in biology called endo, uh, endocytosis. Endocytosis is a process where we, our cells will engulf particles from our environment. So if we can understand coral endosymbiosis, we'll be able to understand what part of this essential machinery in biology is being taken advantage of or evolved to do this and to, to use it to actually, instead of taking up just simple any particles, but involved in taking up the particles such as algae. And once we take them up, usually you just digest them. But in this case, when you take up the right algae type, then instead of eating them up, you actually put them into a, into a membrane sac, as I said, called symbiosome. This symbiosome then protects algae from dying and actually allow algae to live in, inside this membrane compartment. So this unique process is, again, will in endosymbiosis should be shared among different kinds of endo endosymbiosis. I think endosymbiosis is a lesson that everyone loves in high school biology. It's always a fascinating one. So I think that's why people are particularly interested in this topic. So we have time for uh, one last question. Um, and um, there are plenty that we haven't gotten to. So if we did not get to your question, please feel free to uh, email us your question at events at carnegiescience.edu. And um, we will make sure to convey those to Yishan so that she can answer them for you. And so we have uh, three separate people ask this last question. So it's clearly a topic that a lot of people want to know about. And that is if they are really passionate about marine biology and coral, maybe snorkeling or scuba diving, are there citizen science initiatives that they can get involved in that will help your work or help other coral researchers um, to save this amazing ecosystem? Um, so, as far as I know, um, the coral planting, some coral planting uh, organization or sites or institutions involved in this conservation effort probably will take uh, divers who are good at uh, diving and planting. So, definitely, there are organizations that um, involved in conservation effort have opened up these opportunities to help coral planting. That's pretty much all I know. Um, um, definitely do a Google search. I, I, I know, for example, in Florida, there is this institution called MOTT, M-O-T-T, -T, maybe. Um, I think they do coral planting, and I, I think they do use volunteers to go out there to dive and plant corals. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really fascinating work, uh, not only the science, understanding the science behind symbiosis and the evolution of these particular two species, but also the possibility this could have tremendous impact on our efforts to really mitigate global warming. So I want to thank you again. I also want to thank everybody in our audience for joining us today uh, and for providing such enthusiastic support and really great questions. We're always so excited to hear what you think about what we're talking about, and we'd love to have you at our public programs. 
I hope you'll uh, join us in next week when uh, Shauna Morrison, who's from our Earth and Planets Laboratory, uh, will speak about uh, some of the work she's doing with her colleagues, learning about the evolution of, of Martian minerals using information gathered by a robotic geologist that sits on the Mars Curiosity rover, which roams free on the surface of Mars. And as always, we really appreciate your interest in us in Carnegie Science, and thank you, and have a good afternoon.